Okay, uh, so welcome to our final session of our Society of Chemical Industry webinar lectures. My name's uh, Oliver Ring. I'm a process development chemist at AstraZeneca and also a member of the uh, Young Chemist panel. And I'm going to be uh, hosting today's session. Uh, I'm also joined by Jason Tierney and Fred Hancock, who are going to be helping out with the Q&A session at the end of our two speakers. So those of you who aren't aware, the Society of Chemical Industry aims to break down the barriers between uh, industry and academia. And we do this by organizing various uh, conferences, workshop events, uh, including today's webinar session. So those of you who are new to the series, uh, all delegates are put into uh, mute mode throughout the session. Uh, if you have a question throughout either of our two talks for today, please do type that into the questions tab. We'll aim to prioritize as many of those as possible. Uh, and also it'd be, it'd be nice if you could type in uh, the institution that you're affiliated with, whether that's uh, uh, an organization or a university and also where you're dialing in from. Uh, it's really nice for the, for the panel to see uh, where everyone's uh, submitting questions in from. Uh, I'd just like to thank our corporate partners, both uh, or AstraZeneca, UCB and GSK for um, uh, partnering with us for this uh, webinar session. Um, and also I'd like to, to thank our individual sponsors, ICA and Liverpool Chirochem uh, for helping out. Um, we couldn't have done it without you guys. So, so thank you very much for, for sponsoring all of our webinar sessions. Okay, so our first uh, presentation for the day. So we've got uh, Anja Bryshkowska. Uh, so Anya started off her career in chemistry uh, with an undergraduate degree and PhD at the Warsaw University of Technology out in Poland. Uh, she then moved to the uh, UK and undertook a postdoctoral research fellowship at the University of Manchester. Uh, at this point, she then moved to industry, uh, taking up a role at Dr. Reddy's and then MSD. Uh, she's an expert in uh, biocatalytic uh, transformations in both uh, discovery and process chemistry. And uh, today she's going to be presenting on her work uh, for a, a commercial manufacturing scale enzyme cascade reaction. So I think uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Anya and uh, we're all delighted to have you here presenting with us today. Thank you. Um, OK, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Oliver uh, and everyone uh, for having us. It's our great pleasure to be here today uh, uh, and to be able to share some of our work that we've been doing as uh, process chemistry um, uh, in New Jersey, US. And today, Neil and I would like, you, uh, would like to take you on a journey through different types of catalysis and how we apply them uh, in the synthesis of the Slaxovir molecule. Uh, we know that the audience of these webinars is very diverse, so we would like to hear from you what, uh, what, area, what is your area of expertise and what uh, mode of catalysis you specialize in. And in our two joint presentations, we hope to show you that a lot of innovation can happen at the interface of, uh, of disciplines and modes of catalysis. And we are very lucky and privileged here at uh, Merck Sharp and Dome uh, that our teams uh, are composed of multidisciplinary scientists who uh, bring different skill sets um, and different knowledge to the problems uh, we are trying to solve. And as a result, we think that that gives us uh, uh, an opportunity to, to get a better understanding of the reactions we are developing and ultimately uh, come up with a better uh, synthetic route to complex molecules such as um, Slaxovir. So let me start from uh, uh, telling you a little bit about the molecule itself and why we are so excited about it. So Slaxovir is a Merck uh, drug candidate currently progressing in uh, phase three uh, clinical trials for treatment and prophylaxis of HIV infection. As you see on the screen here, the, uh, this is a, um, a deoxynucleoside analog with two unnatural structural elements, this uh, ethyl, ethyl group in a sugar ring and a fluorine group in a, in a base fragment. And due to its uh, unnatural structural features, it displays a novel uh, mechanism of action where it uh, inhibits reverse transcriptase by um, halting the translocation of the growing DNA, uh, the viral DNA chain. Uh, and uh, 
here I'm sharing with you the phase one clinical data uh, now six months into a COVID pandemic, we're probably more accustomed to those kind of plots. So what this plot is uh, showing is um, the viral RNA uh, levels uh, in the blood samples after a single dose of Islatrovir showing how these viral um, RNA levels are efficiently suppressed over a long period of time. So Islatrovir displays high potency and long duration uh, of action, and that uh, holds the promise of reduced frequency of dosing regimens uh, and, um, and uh, uh, lead to significant improvement of patients' lives, as well as uh, uh, gives a promise uh, and, and, and enable us, enabled us to think uh, about uh, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis approaches such as this implantable form. And if you are interested in reading a little bit more about those kind of ideas and approaches, I would encourage you to, to, uh, to check some of the articles that were published um, in the summer last year. But for us as chemists, uh, of course, the most interesting, uh, interesting part is the, um, uh, how are we going to make this molecule in an efficient manner to provide, uh, to provide uh, the drug for clinical trials and then uh, during the commercialization. Several, uh, several uh, uh, routes have been developed to access, uh, access, the, access this uh, nucleoside, um, uh, a lot of them um, with a high number of steps between 12 to 18. And this is a clinical supply route that uh, uh, my colleagues developed a few years ago um, to provide the material for phase one uh, clinical trials. And um, what you can see here is a typical um, a synthesis of uh, the oxynucleoside targets. Uh, uh, and what you can appre appreciate here is uh, a high number of steps, uh, which leads to um, a lot of, um, um, a lot of, uh, um, um, for, uh, which stems from um, the need for um, for protecting groups uh, manipulations uh, and oxidative states uh, readjustments to access this uh, chiral sugar, the oxy-sugar nu uh, nucleosides. The second uh, inefficiency of this route uh, where, uh, is the difficulty in installing this anomeric center, which causes a, a, a yield uh, hit uh, towards the end of the synthesis. So overall, uh, this, uh, the six linear step synthesis involves uh, six, uh, uh, three isolations and gives us a product in 16% over uh, overall yield. And uh, involves a uh, generation of a uh, high amount of waste. So therefore, when we approach the commercialization stage, we the bar for efficiency is set much higher as um, the environmental and economical impact of operating a route that is uh, supposed to deliver uh, multi-ton quantities of a drug over many years uh, of operating that route becomes much more important. And you can think about it in terms of uh, a parameter that we define as a process uh, mass intensity. So typically to access a kilo of pharmaceutical uh, ingredient uh, for each reaction that is involved in its synthesis, uh, we need about 200 kilos of different reagents from material solvents and water. And this mass in uh, divided by mass out is defined as process mass intensity. So as you can imagine, for a multi-step synthesis, uh, this process mass intensity can grow up very quickly, leading to high amounts of waste, where for um, uh, an, a typical six-step synthesis, this, uh, this for, uh, um, mass intensity uh, can ex easily exceed 1,000. Uh, therefore, if, uh, efficient, uh, efficient synthesis of pharmaceutical uh, chemistry are key um, a key uh, challenge of uh, green chemistry. 
And we think that incremental changes uh, in the synthetic routes um, are no longer sufficient. And what we really should aspire to is to get as close as possible to zero waste processes. And in order to achieve that, we need to fundamentally rethink what key building blocks we're going to be using and how um, we can best put them together, uh, significantly reducing the number of steps. And this is where enzyme catalysis can, uh, can provide incredible benefits. And in the next uh, 20 minutes, I'll, I'll show you how we've developed this very uh, unusual enzyme, a fully enzymatic cascade um, to Islatrovir. So many of you might be familiar with hallmarks of biocatalysis, such as high uh, chemo, stereo, or radio selectivity. But for the purpose of the talk today, I wanted to highlight um, two other hallmarks of enzyme catalysis. So unlike the traditional uh, multi-step synthesis where a lot of steps uh, um, are run under conditions which are not compatible uh, with each other, in those multi-step uh, uh, synthesis, uh, we, uh, uh, each of the steps is followed by a number of uh, operations and isolations which adds to time, yield, and, uh, and, and cost of operating such routes. And this is where enzymes uh, and enzyme catalysis really uh, uh, stands out. Enzymes are uniquely suited to operate uh, uh, a, uh, under uh, the same reaction, uh, reaction conditions, um, benefiting from the unique chemo and stereoselectivity and enabling us to think about tandem processes with much uh, reduced footprints uh, giving the promise of lower costs and overheads uh, uh, as well as the efficiency. Uh, the second uh, hallmark of biocatalysis that I wanted to highlight here is that, in fact, uh, enzyme catalysis is programmable and uh, uh, or digital, if you will. And what do I mean by this? Similarly, like in, um, modern, uh, in the modern world where we use digital code to, uh, to store our information and software, nature stores uh, uh, its information and function in the genetic code. And whilst we're still far away from our uh, ability to, to create this genetic uh, uh, code and, and, and function from scratch, what we became really proficient in the past two decades is um, uh, that we are now able to manipulate the genetic sequence of the existing uh, protein molecules and uh, alter its protein sequence and, and therefore function, which enables us to, uh, to, uh, to uh, screen and select for improvements uh, in um, enzyme or protein molecules. And how powerful this technology can be uh, was highlighted by the Nobel Prize awarded to Francis Arnold uh, a couple of years ago. And Francis Arnold in her pioneering research demonstrated that uh, we are able to, by creating thousands of uh, DNA sequences originating from the, uh, the, the, par the same parent sequence, we are able to access thousands of protein so, uh, with modified uh, amino acid sequence and uh, screen them for, uh, for function uh, such as uh, catalysis and therefore uh, use it to select uh, improved biocatalysts. So how did we apply these two principles of cascade catalysis and, uh, and directed evolution in the synthesis of Islatrovir? So as I mentioned before, Islatrovir is a deoxyadenosine analog. Uh, so what, uh, what we uh, begin with was to identify biological pathways that um, enables uh, nature to make, but also break uh, the bonds of deoxynucleosides. 
And while the novel synthesis of uh, nucleosides is as complex as our uh, as, as clinical supply routes, what uh, drew our attention was uh, another pathway present in bacteria. Uh, it's a, a nucleoside salvage pathway which bacteria use to to break the bonds of the nucleosides in, and incorporate uh, the, fra uh, the, the fragments into the, uh, their own metabolism. So how do bacteria reduce the molecular complexity of nucleosides? So in the first step, bacteria uses an enzyme called phosphorylase that uh, catalyzes the cleavage of this glycosidic bonds um, in the presence of the phosphate ions leading to formation of a base and one phosphorylated sugar. This one phosphorylated sugar then becomes a substrate of the second enzyme called mutase, which catalyzes isomerization and uh, switch, flips the position of the one, phosphorylate, uh, uh, one phosphorylated uh, phosphate group to, to the five position. And this 5-phosphorylated deoxyribose then becomes a substrate of the third enzyme, an aldolase, which uh, cleaves the CC bond, leading to formation of, um, of uh, um, phosphorylated glyceraldehyde and acetaldehyde. So as you can see here, this bacterial nucleoside salvage pathway provides an attractive retrosynthetic scheme for deoxynucleosides. So the first question uh, that we ask ourselves, can those natural enzymes uh, accept non-natural uh, uh, structural elements present in a Islatravir molecule? And we began an enzyme discovery program trying to, uh, to identify the enzymes uh, from the nucleoside salvage pathway. And we did so by moving in the reverse direction. So we started from searching for an enzyme uh, catalyzing um, the cleavage of the glycosidic bond. And uh, among the nine, uh, among nine enzymes uh, that, uh, that we tested, we identified uh, that the phosphorylase from E. coli had uh, some activity towards, um, towards a slatrovir molecule. And this is where the directed uh, evolution comes in by, a start, by introducing changes in the amino acid residues in the active side, but also in the, uh, uh, in the, across the entire protein molecule. We were very quickly able to introduce uh, activity, significant activity improvements in the phosphorylase activity towards towards uh, our Islatravir molecule. And um, that in turn enabled us to access this one phosphorylated uh, nucleoside with a variant that had a single point mutation of the methion 65 in the active site. So with this phosphorylated sugar in place, now we were in a position to start uh, searching for a mutase. And again, we screened uh, uh, the same full C bacterial homologs of the mutase to identify again an enzyme from uh, E. coli that displayed um, some uh, initial activity towards, uh, uh, towards this reaction. And yet again, we applied the directed evolution to improve its activity. And in two rounds of selection, we identified a variant with a sufficient activity to, to, uh, to enable us uh, for further development. So with these two enzymes uh, in place with the evolved mutase and phosphorylase, uh, the question that we wanted to ask ourselves is, can we use uh, the sequence to actually make the nucleosides? So as you can notice here, both of these reactions are reversible and the reaction is in fact equilibrium limited. So if we combine the sugar and the base and the two enzymes, we only get the Isolatravir in about 25% conversion. 
And this is where uh, chemistry knowledge uh, um, helps us to, to address the problems of the equilibrium. And we know uh, from Le Chatelier's principle that we can shift the position of a chemical equilibrium uh, using um, well-established uh, strategies such as higher substrate concentration or uh, uh, by, by removing uh, one of the products from the reaction mixture. And uh, that's uh, the, the, the second strategy, so the removal of a product from the reaction mixture was what worked the best in our case when we tested different ways of removing this um, a phosphate byproduct of the reaction, we discovered that we can in, indeed uh, shift the e reaction equilibrium towards the product formation. Uh, among different strategies for the phosphate removal, what, we, uh, uh, what worked the best for us was Yet another enzyme. So the enzyme uh, that, uh, so what we applied here is another enzyme called sucrose phosphorylase. And this was an approach inspired by a report from a French group um, from over 10 years ago, which used the sucrose phosphorylase uh, um, to catalyze the, uh, the cleavage of this uh, uh, sucrose uh, molecule. Um, and form one phosphorylated uh, glucose and, and the fructose. Um, because the equilibrium of this reaction is heavily on the, on the mono sugar side, uh, by including sucrose phosphorylase in the reaction, we were able to shift the reaction equilibrium towards the product formation, towards islatrovila synthesis, and we were able to obtain greater than 85% conversion at 50 grams per liter. Um, so encouraged by this, uh, this uh, very compelling proof of concept that we can use mutase and phosphorylase to make this latrovir, uh, we searched for the third enzyme in the sequence for the aldolase, and we were able to identify and then evolve an aldolase from a bacteria called Chevronella. And, um, and uh, uh, incorporated in the entire sequence. And rem re what was remarkable that, in that indeed this, this three enzyme sequence uh, worked um, really well in the, uh, if the reaction equilibrium was uh, driven by the sucrose phosphorylase. So let me redraw this reaction uh, a little bit to, to clarify the picture. So what is happening in this, uh, in this tandem process, we take three simple building blocks, uh, glyceraldehyde, acetaldehyde, and the base. And the four enzymes work in tandem to rapidly construct the molecular com complexity of the islatrovir molecule, creating multiple new, uh, uh, new bonds in a uh, in a manner free of uh, protecting groups with complete stereoselectivity. And this is a very powerful example of uh, enzymatic cascades and uh, tandem catalysis. And um, uh, uh, in addition to this extraordinary efficiency of the enzymes, what worked particularly well for us was the fact that uh, isolatrovir uh, is um, not very soluble in water. Uh, so in this, in this four enzyme cascade, the product crystallized directly from the reaction solution, and we were able to isolate it in greater than 80% yield. So we were very excited at this stage, but what was really stopping us from developing as a manufacturing route was the access to this uh, chiral aldehyde building block. Um, although it, it looks very simple, the, uh, the, this phosphorylated glyceraldehyde uh, is actually quite complex and difficult to obtain using traditional uh, chemical methods because it contains a, a fully substituted um, carbon atom. It also contains a phosphate group at one end and, a, and, and the aldehyde at the other group. So there weren't that many uh, chemical uh, routes that we could base our synthesis of this molecule on. 
Therefore, we looked again at the enzymatic ways how we could access this, uh, this molecule. And our retrosynthetic analysis pointed us toward this uh, prochiral trial derivative. So what we imagine uh, uh, that, uh, that we could apply a sequence of two reactions, uh, an oxidation of one of the primary alcohols uh, uh, followed by phosphorylation to access this complex aldehyde in a, in, a, in a very concise, elegant sequence. Equally, we could think of uh, executing the steps in the reverse manner, um, uh, so introducing the phosphate group and, the uh, and uh, oxidizing the remaining um, um, primary alcohol in the next step. So yet again, we started an enzyme uh, discovery program uh, uh, trying to identify biocatalyst capable of catalyzing any of these four reactions. And what we were able to identify uh, in, uh, among natural enzymes were the enzymes from the top pathway. So <clears throat> at this point, I would like to tell you a little bit about this first, uh, first step, uh, disymmetrizing oxidation. Um, so this is a seemingly simple reaction, uh, yet uh, I wanted to pause here to kind of appreciate what, what the enzyme catalysis is uh, uh, enabling us to do. So what we identify was an enzyme uh, called galactose oxidase uh, that was capable of uh, protecting group free decimetrization of this uh, a, a simple trial leading to formation of the aldehyde with a minimal overoxidation to the carboxylic acid. So this is something uh, very difficult to achieve um, using traditional uh, synthetic methods. This enzyme uh, is a, uh, has a very unique uh, mechanism, it is a copper dependent uh, uh, enzyme and it will become the, the hero of the story that Neil will be telling you in just a few minutes. But what I wanted to highlight here was, uh, was uh, um, uh, the fact that the enzyme we identified in nature had the wrong stir selectivity. So uh, the wild type uh, galactose oxidase uh, had a strong preference towards the S, a pro S uh, um, alcohol group. And this is where we applied uh, and uh, directed evolution again, but this time to uh, enable us the reversal of uh, nanotoselectivity of the natural enzyme. And indeed, in a number of uh, uh, rounds of directed evolution, we were able to almost completely uh, uh, flip the uh, natural uh, stereoselectivity of the enzyme and evolve galactose oxidase to give us access to the R enantiomer of the aldehyde. And we did so by introducing a number of mutations uh, which remodeled the active site where the substrate binds, but we also introduced a number of mutations across the entire protein molecule, uh, which um, improved uh, its stability, activity, and expression. Uh, so with, this, uh, with the oxidase uh, uh, in place, uh, we also were able to uh, identify a kinase and we uh, again evolved it for the activity. And that's what we published uh, in our paper um, uh, uh, in December 2019. And what we've been focusing on since was to how to imp uh, develop these two enzymatic reactions into an efficient process. And while the kinase uh, was uh, giving us the, uh, uh, the phosphorylated uh, aldehyde in uh, quantitative yield and high conversion, the imperfect stereoselectivity of the uh, galactose oxidase uh, led to significant uh, yield loss in the step. So as process chemists, we are never satisfied with the with the reaction that we developed and we aim to learn more about the system and how to improve it. And what we work, uh, what we learned uh, working with these two enzymes was that uh, during the evolution process, the kinase gained uh, another function. So what we, uh, what we um, 
uh, discovered studying this reaction in more detail that the kinase was now able to also catalyze the desmetrizing phosphorylation of the trio, installing this phosphate group with remarkable stir cell activity and activity. So this was a compelling reason for us to revisit the sequence of the reactions that, uh, that we were trying to access this aldehyde with and uh, see if the oxidoreductase that we evolved on the activity on the trial can now also oxidize the phosphorylated trial. And indeed it could. So over the course of evolution, oxidase also gained some function towards this, uh, the substrate for which we previously were unable to find the activity. And what was attractive about this, uh, this reaction was that we observed a few fewer byproducts. So at this point, although very late in the process development, we make a made a decision that it's beneficial for the process for us to swap the, uh, or the sequence of uh, phosphorylation and oxidation. And we also switched the focus of directed evolution. And, um, and uh, what this example is showing you is what Francis Arnold refers uh, frequently as innovation by evolution. So uh, by, by evolving an enzyme for a different function, it sometimes can gain an additional function on the substrate or chemistry that was not present in, uh, in nature. And indeed, in case of galactose oxidase, we were able to first evolve its activity towards uh, the phosphorylated trial and ultimately also uh, improve its activity towards the phosphorylated trial. And with additional rounds of evolution, we were able to find a variant that uh, could quantitatively oxidize the, uh, the, 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 uh, the substrate and give us 90% yield. So this is the final uh, manufacturing route that we have developed. Uh, so, uh, and, and the, the full uh, three, uh, three uh, sequence consisting of three biocatalytic steps. So uh, the process that we developed consists of uh, first phosphorylation. So installing this phosphate group in a desmetrizing fashion followed by its, uh, the oxidation of the phosphorylated trial and then the entire glycosylation uh, sequence. This, uh, this uh, enzymatic cascades pro uh, progresses in a single solvent stream with no isolation of intermediates. And over the pro uh, course of process development, we engineered seven out of nine enzymes required to execute these three steps. And last month, we uh, finished the demonstration of this chemistry uh, in our pilot plan here in Rahway, New Jersey, demonstrating this uh, robust chemistry at 12 kilo scale. So this route, uh, <coughs> excuse me, this route, the efficiency of this route exceeds uh, the efficiency of any of the uh, previous synthesis significantly lowering the number of steps and increasing the overall yield of the process by um, almost fourfold, which contributed to uh, not only higher efficiency, but significantly reduced waste, where we uh, reduced the process mass intensity factor by, uh, by almost 15 fold. So with that, I hope, uh, I managed to convince you that biocatalysis can be a powerful tool in pharmaceutical uh, industry and the enzyme cascades um, underpinned by directed evolution um, can uh, enable us access to the best chemistry, lower, significantly lower number of steps and costs and, and, and waste generated in process at the same time providing us access to high quality um, drug, pro, uh, drug substance in high yield. And our ability to develop this cascade uh, is a testament to our strategic investment in biocatalysis and protein engineering um, uh, about five years ago. Uh, because the access to these capabilities and the expansion 
is now allowing us to fundamentally change how we make new molecules. Taking advantage uh, on, of uh, all the innovation that is currently happening at the interface of biology, chemistry, and computation. And we envisage uh, a growing adoption of biocatalytic cascades uh, as a strategy for sustainable synthesis of complex non-natural molecules as pharmaceuticals across uh, the entire pipeline. And we believe that it will, uh, the rapid expansion of enzymatic chemistries will help us uh, to continue to simplify our supply chain and develop efficient processes but also will help us uh, to uh, accelerate the exploration of a new chemical space in drug discovery and design, uh, helping to, to uh, also at the drug discovery stage. So with that, uh, I wanted to uh, uh, thank the entire Islatrevier team that contributed towards the development of this process. Um, we say that um, it takes a village to, to, uh, to develop a drug molecule, and this is the, uh, the Islatrovil village of uh, scientists and in, uh, chemists, engineers, and biologists that co contributed to the process development. And this is a photo of just a few of us that celebrated last year the proof of concept of the route. So with that, I wanted to finish, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thanks, Anya. That was that was a really, really cool, really cool talk. Um, really exciting chemistry going on there. Um, I've got a quick question before I hand over to uh, Jason and Fred. So you mentioned uh, that you engineered seven was it seven enzymes. How, what's the time frame for actually doing a direct evolution? I appreciate the teams are massive, so it may de depend on the department and stuff like that, but just like a sure. rough time frame. So on average, a round of directed evolution takes from three to four weeks. Uh, different enzymes will, of course, require uh, different evolutionary efforts. So some of these enzymes only require two rounds of evolution. The most challenging was the galactose oxidase, which uh, uh, required close to 17 rounds of evolution. So uh, in some of those cases, we've been engineering these enzymes over the period of, uh, of, of a, um, a year or two. Cool. That was a really, really cool talk. Um, so yeah, just a reminder, uh, if everyone could um, type in uh, where they're dialing in from and also the institution they're affiliated with, and uh, I'll just hand over to Fred and Jason. Jason. Okay, so uh, yeah, we've got first question we've got from Sam Staniland, who's from uh, Johnson Matty, I believe, um, and he's asking about the concentrations that were used for the biocatalysis steps. So you, you had three steps in your final route there. So sure. Uh, so this, uh, as we run, uh, as we run these reactions, we gradually um, uh, um, we start from about. Uh, 50 gram uh, per liter of uh, the, uh, the this prochiral trial. So this is uh, close to 500 millimolar concentration. And um, as we add more and more components, this becomes uh, a more dilute. So the final step is uh, run about 300 millimolar concentration. So, uh, so that's about uh, 30 grams per liter. And although that might not uh, sound that impressive from a traditional point of view, uh, chemist point of view, I wanted to highlight here that there is no isolation in the entire process. So, uh, so that translates to, uh, to overall um, a great efficiency of the synthesis. And yeah, we have a question from uh, Chris Brown at um, Evatech asking about the consideration. You talked about going to, you know, multi-ton scale. So, what are the considerations for enzymes uh, as you scale, as you scale the process? Yeah, so we work well, really closely with our uh, our um, um, uh, our partners who help us to develop. Uh, 
fermentations of these enzymes, uh, which uh, which are made to our specifications. So we also work really closely with uh, regulatory bodies to to make sure that um, uh, that uh, we demonstrate the control over our process and we. Uh, uh, and over the, 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 the purity of the material generated in this route. Uh, we uh, um, we uh, developed a suite of analytical tools that help us to characterize uh, the, the intermediates and the enzymes in such a way that, uh, that we have uh, high confidence in, in their efficiency, selectivity, and uh, that nothing gets, uh, gets altered. Uh, over the course of evolution, um, we were able to decrease the enzyme requirements uh, for many of these enzymes to level 1% loading or lower. So although, uh, although those routes are, will be operated at multi-ton scale, um, the enzyme requirements is actually not that high, uh, which also helps with a, a more efficient supply chain for the biocatalysts. I hope that answered the question, so, but it's, it's a very broad question, so feel free to reach out if you have any any specific uh, uh, concerns or questions about that. Yeah, we've, we've okay, got thank a... Thank you, thank you. We've got a question from... Um, I think I'm going to spell it, say it right, but Lauren Dakar, which is, I think he's from UCSB, um, very interested by the talk. Thanks for that. And basically saying about the obstacles of working on biocatalysis. I think I think one thing that strikes me is the is there any batch dependence on, on the enzyme? Um, if you're doing a campaign, let's say 12 kilos. Um, how do you go through go about that? Sure. Uh, so similarly, like with a, a, a traditional chemical process, as you scale up enzyme manufacture, you also want to make sure that uh, that uh, you uh, you are able to make an uh, enzyme uh, of a high quality or consistent quality. And this is where uh, where our uh, fermentation partners are excellent and help us to achieve that goal. Uh, so we develop a very reliable fermentation processes to to enable us the delivery of uh, um, of uh, enzymes of consistent quality. And of course, for those processes, we have our uh, assays and uh, quality specifications that help us to to identify that potentially batches that may may have a subpar quality, um, but uh, Obviously, the more we, uh, the more fermentations we run, the more we are able to to uh, very well control these processes and get consistent material. Okay, if Fred, do you, do you want as uh, a question? A question. Should we there? should we switch to Neil and then was, come back to the questions? Yes, we better come back, haven't we, Anya? That was very. Yeah, we have. Thanks for answering those, and I'm sure you have some more at the end. Yeah, yeah. definitely. There's, there's one good one oh, waiting. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so our second speaker is uh, Neil Strotman. Uh, so Neil started off his career um, at the uh, Franklin Marshall uh, College in Pennsylvania. Uh, he then did uh, his PhD at the uh, Wisconsin Manson University uh, before moving to Massachusetts Institute of Technology to undertake his postdoctoral research fellowship. Uh, he's worked in various different organizations, including uh, Bristol Myers Squibb and uh, Merck, and is currently um, a director of catalysis uh, and has worked in various different um, areas of, of chemistry, including both discovery and process chemistry. Uh, today, he's going to be giving his presentation on uh, aerobic oxidations, either using uh, metalloenzymes or electrochemistry. So, I'm um, going to pass over to Neil. I'm looking forward to your talk. Um, yeah, thank you to Oliver and, and uh, all the organizers for this invitation. This is really a great uh, opportunity that, that I'm very excited to be, and I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so in the first part, Anya showed you um, this excellent biocatalytic route that was developed to a slot Um, What I'm gonna focus on here is specifically the aerobic oxidation step um, and how we can combine both uh, biocatalysis with transition metal catalysis or with electrocatalysis um, to develop even, uh, even superior conditions. So first, uh, just wanna review, this is the route that was developed. And what I'm gonna be focusing on is this oxidation step. 
So in general, oxidations are synthetic steps that we try to avoid using, whether in process chemistry or, or in uh, discovery chemistry. Um, and to conduct an asymmetric alcoholic oxidation in water um, to yield an aldehyde is not currently feasible by chemical means. So we were very fortunate to have this biocatalytic process in place, and it was really pivotal to the success of the round. Um, and it proven to be one of the most complex, challenging, and poorly understood steps. So given these challenges, um, we really needed to understand better what was going on here. And, and our goal was to seek out mechanistic understanding um, and look for opportunities to further streamline this process. And as you can see, there are three enzymes involved in this process. Three enzymes involved in this process. Um, as well as air needs to be bubbled through continuously. So it is a, a challenging system for sure. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the galactose oxidation step. So as you can see, there are three enzymes used in it, three metalloenzymes. Um, the first is galactose oxidase, the second catalase, and the third is horseradish peroxidase, um, which I've abbreviated in some places as HRP. And while this process did work well, um, there were some challenges and limitations associated with it. First, there was a relatively high protein burn, which made purification downstream challenging. The yield early on was quite moderate. Um, there were also over-oxidation byproducts, such as formic acid shown here. And additionally, the horseradish peroxidase was quite expensive, leading us to look for alternatives. So first, I just want to explain a bit about how GOACE works, and how galactose oxidase works. So Combined with oxygen, galactose oxidase takes the alcohol and selectively oxidizes one end of this, desymmetrizing the molecule to make this aldehyde, and it generates hydrogen peroxide in the process. Now, hydrogen peroxide, if left to its own devices, can cause undesired byproducts, um, such as this glyceric acid or formic acid, um, or it can also cause decomposition of the enzymes. So it's important that this that this, uh, that this peroxide is converted back to oxygen. Um, and that's what catalase is used for, spitting out water and regenerating half of the oxygen. Now, just to look at the function of GOACE on a molecular level, um, if we start with this redu reduced form of, uh, of GOACE, so a copper one species, we act with oxygen, form this copper um, uh, di di uh, dioxygen species, which then goes to this copper uh, peroxide. This liberates, oh, and, and this is assisted by two tyrosines. Um, this liberates hydrogen peroxide and now generates this oxidized species. Now this has been oxidized by two electrons. It's gone from copper one to copper two, but you'll notice this tyrosine derivative has also been oxidized on the airing ring. So now this oxidized form of the catalyst is what's able to oxidize the substrate. Um, it binds to the alcohol. Um, there's a transfer at this step of a uh, hydride radical or a hydrogen radical from, uh, from the alcohol to the tyrosine, giving us the aldehyde, which is then liberated and then regenerates the, the reduced form of the copper catalyst. So my group got involved at this point, um, approaching this from a chemocatalysis perspective. So instead of viewing these as enzymes, can we view these metalloenzymes as uh, complexes with metal centers and large ligands on them? So first we have galactose oxidase, and we know that this is required to achieve enantioselectivity. And so we're showing it as copper with a chiral ligand here. And we were actually very happy with the selectivity that was obtained here and thought this would be difficult by other means. So we knew we wanted to keep that enzyme in place and didn't want to make any modifications there. But what about catalase or horseradish peroxidase? These are both um, iron porphyrin species. And we wondered, for example, with catalase, can we disproportionate hydrogen peroxide with small molecule alternatives? Does it really need to be this enormous enzyme? Um, and I'll get into the role of what horseradish peroxidase is in a second. Um, but we also wondered, can we replace HRP with a small molecule alternative? So first focusing on the disproportionation of hydrogen peroxide. Um, as I mentioned, this, is, uh, this contains four iron porphyrin groups. Um, and this is actually an incredibly active enzyme. It holds the world record as the most active enzyme, um, carrying out over 6 million turnovers per second. So based on that, you would expect to never see hydrogen peroxide build up and have any of the um, problems associated with that. But we do, and we see over the course of the reaction that it grows. Um, 
And as I mentioned earlier, this leads to the formation of glyceric acid, formic acid. It also leads to decomposition of the enzyme, which can lead to reduced reaction rates. And further experiments reveal that the product actually inhibits catalase. So of course, this raised the question of us, to us of, can we avoid catalase altogether and go with a small molecule alternative? And so this is a small sampling of, of what we looked at, but we evaluated dozens of transition metal species to assess the conversion and the levels of formic acid generated. We found that formic acid was actually a great marker to use to look at the effectiveness of, of removing hydrogen peroxide as it was quite easy to assay for. And what we're reporting here is the ratio of formic acid to the product that's formed. So you can see if no catalase or, or organometallic species is, uh, is added, you have a very high ratio of formic acid to product. On the other hand, when catalase was used, you can control this to only 5%. We we're also pleasantly surprised to see that a variety of other metal species could control this to a relatively low level. And this was just in preliminary experiments when we saw this. Particularly patent, platinum looked promising and using one weight percent of platinum on carbon, we're able to control this to a reasonable level. Manganese acetate also controlled the formic acid formation quite well, and, and we, we felt this was highly promising. Um, however, in the same time frame, biocatalysis identified another catalase variant which did not exhibit inhibit inhibition behavior and gave less than 1% of the formic acid byproduct. So we were quite excited that we um, obtained proof of concept on this transition metal catalyzed proportionation strategy in an enzymatic system, and it really gave us a lot of confidence that we could apply this type of approach in the future to other systems. So now I'll we'll come back to HRP and why this is required. Um, so I showed you before this, this cycle um, between this low valent copper and, and higher valent copper. Um, what I didn't mention is that there's actually a third uh, um, oxidation state available to this. So the semi-reduced form. And so what we're, so the role of horseradish peroxidase is to initially take this, this reduced form and oxidize it to the active form. And also throughout the course of the reaction, occasionally the catalyst falls off the catalytic cycle and falls to this inactive form. And again, having horseradish peroxidase there is known to regenerate the active catalyst. And just for comparison, in a reaction with horseradish peroxidase, you get 57% conversion. With no peroxidase, the reaction stalls at only 3% conversion. So it really is critical to the activity of galactose oxidase. But there are limitations and problems with horseradish peroxidase. Um, it is a purified enzyme and as such is quite expensive. So we're talking about $60,000 per kilogram. Um, moreover, it, it introduces an additional protein burden. So we wanted to know, are there, are there other ways that we can activate GOES via oxidation? So in addition to the enzymatic way with HRP, we wondered if we could do this using a chemical activation with an, oxi with an oxidant or electrochemical activation, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, and we felt that discovering new strategies could um, enable a wider application in, in commercial processes. All right, and so the system that we looked at was using 20 weight percent GOACE, um, bubbling oxygen in, through, in nitrogen through the system and eight weight percent catalase. Um, the challenges that we expected though um, were GOACE compatibility. Um, so the oxygen that we use would have to not be such a strong oxidant that it would attack the enzyme and deactivate it. Moreover, we don't want our oxidant to react directly with the trial and give us um, unselective oxidation. So we screened over 110 oxidants using high throughput experimentation. And what you can see is that without a chemical oxidant, the conversion is very low, about 3%. With horseradish peroxidase, you're here just over 60%. But we were very excited to find that there were a handful of um, simple metal species that gave um, very high conversions of this, of this in this reaction. Particularly manganese three species were successful as, as was sodium persulfate. And what we found further is that we can reduce the mangan manganese acetate to two mole percent relative to substrate, indicating that GOACE only falls off the catalytic cycle less than once in every 50 turnovers. And I uh, just want to briefly show the scope of this reaction. Um, we looked at a variety of benzylic alcohols. And um, just for comparison, you have no activator. You have the system with manganese acetate, which turned out to be the most promising activator to use, and HRP. 
Um, and as you can see, manganese acetate is giving us far more reactivity than with no activator at all. And, and in a lot of cases, comparable performance to HRP. Um, I'll just mention here too that uh, GoACE, there are different variants, um, both from our internal evolution and from uh, what's commercially available. And they do have, tend to have different activities. Um, for example, with this M1 variant in this case, we see that even with no activator, there is some background reaction here, presumably because the GOACE has an easier time activating on its own with just dioxygen. But again, adding in ma manganese acetate really does accelerate this process and get you to a useful low level of conversion. So it works on these five benzoic alcohols. Um, Synamyl alcohols also work well in this case, giving us uh, uh, high, high conversion and moderate yields. And one more piece of data that we wanted to add to this is uh, spectro spectroscopic evidence for the activation of GOACE by the chemical oxidant. In this case, we decided to use sodium persulfate. Um, this was our third best chemical oxidant, um, but where manganese acetate was not fully soluble in the reaction mixture and was UV active, sodium persulfate does readily dissolve and doesn't have a chromophore. So we're able to, e to easily monitor um, conversion of GOACE here. And we can see over the period of an hour how GOACE moved from this inactive form um, to the oxi oxidized form. So we're really excited about this. Um, and this seemed like a great option and alternative to HRP. At the same time, in parallel though, we decided to investigate electrocatalysis. So electrochemistry is a green and sustainable technique. It's been applied in bioanalysis, energy conversion, and you know, more, reasonably, more, more recently in organic synthesis. And we hope to take advantages of the, the benefits of electrochemistry here. The way that this could work is that GOACE um, would go through this normal catalytic cycle. Um, it would oxidize the alcohol and get to the reduced form of GOACE. We would hope that it would then react with oxygen and go around the catalytic cycle as intended. But on the occasion that it were deactivated to the semi-reduced species, we hope to have anodic oxidation of the GOACE um, to regenerate the oxidized form. And of course, that would be accompanied by uh, cathodic H plus reduction. All right, so, um, so first we had to figure out where we should try to operate for this. And the uh, redox potential for GOACE um, from the, from the semi-oxidized to the fully oxidized has been previously measured at about 0.2 volts. And this is what we were able to measure ourselves as well. Um, it's also known for, um, for H plus reduction that it just should be negative 0.6 volts. Okay, so this gave us an approximate um, uh, redox potential of about 0.8 volts that we felt we would have to put into the system. So that was a good starting point at least. And our initial attempt, we were so excited, uh, unfortunately gave no results. So there's no conversion at all. And um, it occurred to us that, um, that um, electron transfer between GOACE and the electrode is kinetically slow. So could we solve this problem using a redox mediator? And this worked wonderfully. Um, you can see on the bottom here that with horseradish peroxidase, we can get 55% assay yield of 71% conversion. Uh, with using electricity now and this water soluble ferrocene derivative, we can get 50% assay yield. So very, very similar. Most importantly, we're maintaining this high enantial selectivity. And that's telling us that oxidation is not occurring directly at the alcohol with, with the mediator or with the electrode but rather it is activating GOACE and GOACE is asymmetrically carrying out this transformation. We were also quite excited about this ferrocene derivative because it seemed quite robust and, and didn't, didn't exhibit must degradation. And for the five mole percent that we put into the system, we recover 4% at the end of reaction. So here's our proposed mechanism. The reduced um, mediator reacts at the electrode to give us the oxidized form. Then the semi-reduced GOACE reacts with this mediator, going to the oxidized GOACE. It does the intended chemistry. And again, the majority of the time goes through this working cycle, which productively produces the, the, the product and uh, cycles between the reduced and the oxidized GOACE. But in the rare occasion that it, that it does fall off the cycle, it goes back to this GOACE semi, which is then re-oxidized through electrochemically. So we ran some control experiments to differentiate what the different components of this reaction were actually doing. And we start with our base case at the top here, 50% yield um, and 3% formic acid. So if we remove the GOACE, you see very low conversion, only a few percent. If you remove the copper, 
Uh, you do see some activity, but it's still quite low. Um, we suspect that um, the parpamillian level exogenous copper that's present in some of our, um, uh, our reagents is, is, uh, is responsible for this. But as you can see, it is still much lower than in the, the uh, normal reaction. If we leave out catalase, as we discussed before, now you build up hydrogen peroxide. So not only do your yield and conversion suffer, but you also see a much higher level of formic acid. If you leave out electricity, nothing happens here. And then finally, if you leave out the mediator, there's, a, there's almost no reaction. And then I'll mention also, if you don't vigorously bubble air through the system, the, the, the conversion is much lower as well. So now we can see what each of these components was responsible for and what each of them contributed to the reaction. Okay, and so our initial experiments had been carried out around 0.8 volts that we, that was the back of the envelope calculation that we did to, to suggest where we should operate. Um, we wanted to see what would happen if we could increase the conversion and rate by increasing the, uh, the voltage. And as you can see, as we move from 0.75 volts to 0.8 to 0.85, we see the conversion, this red dot, go up and up. We also see the yield, the dark green, go up and up. As we go beyond that, though, the conversion does in continue to increase, but the yield really doesn't. It stays pretty flat. And what we're seeing instead are significant byproducts being formed. And so the reaction does proceed at a faster rate, and it does proceed further, but it's not a productive reaction. We're just forming more byproducts. And on the right-hand side here, um, also mentioned this is just the profile at one volt. And again, you see the reaction looks pretty good from the start with, with uh, yield matching conversion quite well. But as you start to build up aldehyde, that starts to be over-oxidized, giving us byproducts um, and, and a reduced yield. All right, and although we've done the initial work on this water-soluble ferrocene derivative, we wanted to look at what the change in, um, in mediator would, would, would do to the system. And we wondered if going to a, uh, a mediator with a higher oxidation potential could give us faster conversion or, or higher conversion. Um, but what we see here is that across the board, going from uh, 0.2 up to 0.67, we really have essentially no change in the yield or conversion. Um, and most importantly, no change in the enantioselectivity. So even at these, um, even with these very aggressive mediators, we're still not seeing any direct oxidation of the alcohol. It is all still going through the GOES. So this did show us that the voltage applied to the electrodes has a much greater influence on conversion than the nature of the mediator. All right, and we looked at the generality of this again a bit. Um, again, because these enzymes are really engineered for a specific substrate, we looked at a few different GOASes and found that different ones were optimal for different substrates. But again, in, in all these cases, we were able to find you know, moderate to, to high yields um, using, this, using this electrochemical process. And just for comparison, the numbers in parentheses are what you obtain if no electricity is used. All right, and so, um, so high conversion, moderate, moderate to high yields um, for a variety of benzoic alcohols, also, cinnamic alcohol works in this case. Um, these diols also worked quite well. And I'll point out one particular case down here where um, you can really influence the product distribution by using the F2 GOES versus the, the round 12 VB one. Um, in one case, favoring the monooxidation to the aldehyde, and in another case, favoring the, uh, the dialdehyde formation. And I just want to take a mention, a moment to, to, to mention the, the proposed mechanism in this case. So we decided to study this by cyclic voltometry because you can extract quite a bit of data from this. This would tell us the redox properties of the GOACE um, and tell us the, uh, the electron transfer kinetics between GOACE and the, medi and the mediator. The dark pink trace here or dark purple trace here is showing just the trial and mediator. So there's no catalysis going on here. So this is a fully reversible wave. But you can see when we now introduce the GOACE to this, we are seeing catalysis occur. And the, the difference between the light pink and the dark pink and the light green and the dark green is that we've changed the, the, the rate, of, um, the sweep rate across the, uh, the voltammogram. And what this allows us to do is fit this data and from it extract rates of electron transfer. And we can we set up the plot here showing how um, the log of this rate um, really is linear with the uh, with the uh, with the energy of this. 
so with the um, with the potential of this. And you also see um, a linear dependence between the log of the um, electron transfer rate and the pH. So collectively, what this tells us, right? So, um, so both the so the electron transfer rate is 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 dependent both on the pH, um, as well as the uh, the electron potential here. Um, so this tells us this, that this is a proton coupled electron transfer. Both of these components, both the pH and the um, the current, are involved in the rate determining step. Um, it's also interesting to note that. GOACE, it looks like, can be turned over by mediators without oxygen, as is shown here, though it occurs at very low rates. And, um, and so this is something we can see on an analytical scale, but really is not useful or practical from a synthetic scale. All right, so I hope I've shown you in this portion of the talk that there's a huge opportunity for combining the fields of biocatalysis with either transition metal catalysis or electrocatalysis, or we'll see what other areas in the future um, to really generate the best possible processes. And our process research department, which co-locates biocatalysis, protein engineering, and chemocatalysis, um, has really created an environment where we can develop the best processes and implement these um, independent of the platform that we have. And today we showed a promising proof of concept for using substoichiometric small molecule activators for GOACE as an alternative to an expensive HRP enzyme. We also developed a bioelectrocatalytic process that shows not only utility in this system and in oxidation of other alcohols, but promise of further applications. And we hope to have many future collaborations of this kind with biocatalysis. I'd also like to just point out some of the strategic investments that we made in these areas. So a 20 year investment in transition metal catalysis continues to pay dividends for our department. The range of capabilities and scope will continue to expand based on the needs of the portfolio and the state of the science. And more recently, we've made a strategic investment in electrochemistry. And while we're in an early stage, we're already beginning to see some of the benefits of this. In parallel, we're working to build improved capabilities for small scale screening, reaction discovery and process development. We're also looking to build batch and flow scale up capabilities, provide a path from R&D to manufacturing. Okay, with that, I'd like to thank everyone who worked on this and, and uh, particularly the, the really excellent team that did the bulk of this work. So Heather Johnson and Xiaogong Zhang, from the catalysis group and as well as Serge Ricola from uh, the analytical enabling technologies group. Um, and I'd like to thank all of you for your time and attention. And uh, I'm sure Anya and I will be happy to take any further questions. Thank you. Okay, um, fantastic talk. Really, really cool uh -huh. chemistry going on there. Um, <laughs> just got a quick question. So um, all of the metal catalysis stuff, how, um, how do you optimize this stuff for earlier stages, knowing that you've then got two telescope stages later on? So how, how, how can you optimize this without it affecting the downstream, downstream chemistry? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, we had to work closely with the project team. And once we had some promising leads, pass some of those solutions off to them to have them tested in downstream chemistry and see how it would behave. Um, but we also looked into other options for filtering off the material, doing charcoal treatments, and we thought about different ways that we could try to remove these. Um, in general, we also felt that if we were using oxidants that weren't too strong and weren't reacting negatively with the GOACE enzyme, hopefully they also wouldn't cause decomposition to other enzymes. Okay, so so in the event that it did affect downstream chemistry, you could have purged all of that and then done this in a sort of stepwise fashion instead. Yes, yes. I mean, definitely the preference was to do this as a as a one pot reaction and not yeah. have to remove anything, but we were prepared for that possibility. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, really, really Thanks. cool talk. Neil, I had just a question. It was it's um it's a complex system with the uh, GOAs and uh, oxygen and a, and a mediator in an electrochemical. Um, do you do, do you see any um, any any uh, influence of uh, the, the, the you know the the, the the mechanics of the electrode system? Mm. So you're asking more about the geometry of the electrodes or the choice of electrodes? Yeah. Yes. The the, the physical form and the, and the surface yeah. structure of the electrode. Yeah, I think that's something we would have had to look into if we had more time. We did screen a variety of electrodes before deciding on the platinum electrode or the platinum um, cathode and anode. 
Um, I, I, we did not look into the surface structure. I, you know, I think that's that's sort of the next level of development that would be necessary, though, for sure. Um, I think the mediator fortunately helps alleviate a lot of those concerns. Um, if we were looking for a direct contact with the GOES, we'd, it would be a much more difficult problem, but I think having the mediator there does alleviate some of those concerns. Yes. And what's the transport mechanism between um, the, 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 the mediator being oxidized and its, its delivery to the, um, to the enzyme? It's a good question. I, I, unfortunately, I can't comment on that. Yeah. Right. It's 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 interesting. I was just wondering how, that. how that can get all the way to the active site that's buried inside this. Um, yeah, that's right. It is remarkable. Okay. Sometimes I thought there was something to do with the structure of the of the enzymes itself. They could almost they could almost walk across the surface of the enzyme once they have once the yeah. mediator is attached to it. But yeah. Okay. Shall we shall we move on to the some of the attendee? questions so we yes we've got, a, um, <laughs> we've, got a, we've got a question here um this is a good one came it came up earlier i'm going to struggle to say pronounce it um it's kamanagaru thank krishna i really hope i pronounced that correctly <laughs> um we've got a very good question and i think it goes to both of you really um to, an opinion on protein contamination uh in respect to regulatory um, in regards to wild type or recombinant enzymes. Um, so I think it's it's potentially protein contamination on your final API, and then whether it's better to have wild type or recombinant enzymes for process. Does that make sense? <laughs> so I don't know which one wants to take a answer. Okay, well, take it. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll, I'll give it a go. Uh, so, with regards to the protein contamination uh, and and protein and and impurity control strategies, you have to implement uh, the same strategies you would implement for any other process uh, to demonstrate the quality of the material. Uh, in case of our compound, um, as I mentioned, uh, the um, uh, the uh, nucleoside is not soluble in water, so uh, so the removal from the reaction mixture is straightforward. But we also have a crystallization steps uh, after the, the the isolation in order to uh, to get high quality API material. Uh, so that also helps us with removal of any of uh, the, the impurities related uh, to to the enzyme. And last but not least, we obviously have um, analytical assays that will uh, help us to uh, measure and, uh, the levels of different uh, reaction components, including proteins or, uh, uh, or other cellular material and, uh, and uh, specifications that we need to meet um, on delivering the, the active pharmaceutical material. Mm -hmm. Oh, With, yeah, I'll, I'll just mention too that you know our company has a lot of experience in this area, um, going back to Genuvia ten years ago, and really understands not only how to control levels but how to set those specifications and and find something that's going to be that regulators are going to be comfortable with as well. Yeah, Fred, do you, do you, there's another you, question? Yes, I've, I've got another another question. Um, um, and yeah, I, I was wondering if you could say something about, um, you know, because we, we've talked here about just about wild type and recombinant, uh, but I was wondering if you do any uh, metagenomic uh, studies as well. Uh, so most of our enzymes, uh, uh, I mean, uh, perhaps this question uh, pertains, how do we discover enzymatic activity uh, in nature? And we will apply here any accessible strategies um, uh, spanning from screening uh, commercial enzymes to um, metagenomic libraries or, or uh, 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 enzyme discovery or, or just um, uh, literature reports of an enzyme and, and, and then its recombinant, uh, recombinant production. So whatever allows us to, uh, whatever strategy allows us to to uh, identify this initial uh, activity, uh, this is what we are going to uh, employ. Um, 
as you, uh, as you heard in our talk, we use directed evolution a lot to, um, this is probably uh, something um, intrinsic to the pharmaceutical industry that very rarely natural enzymes uh, have the desired levels of activity, selectivity on the substrates that we deal with. Uh, so uh, so um, uh, um, in general, we, uh, we use, uh, we evolve enzymes and, and therefore uh, we prefer use them in a recombinant way when we evolve them in E. coli. Um, the enzymes we don't evolve are usually the, uh, in this process where the auxiliary enzymes such as catalase or HRP, which uh, also in our system act on the natural substrate. So, uh, so um, there wasn't a strong driver to improve the activity because they're sufficiently active already. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, I'm going to move on to one of uh, one of the questions from the delegates. So we've got a question here from Sebastian Cosgrove from Manchester University. Uh, so I think this is a question for both of you, and it's related to the engineered uh, goes. Um, so he's he's wondering whether you performed any AMO measurements. Um, I guess he means KM measurement used in the final cascade. Does, um, that, got, does that question make sense to you? <laughs> I don't know what an AMO is, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, we might. <laughs> so, it, might be, um, it might mean the Kalis, I think he means KM. Well, sure. Yeah, he's just said uh, KM for oxygen, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, when we, uh, run directed evolution in the industrial setting, we very rarely have time and opportunity in detailed characterization of, uh, of the variants that we're obtaining in evolution. And we assess their fitness in our reaction of choice without investigating in detail uh, the catalytic um, properties such as uh, uh, KM or KCAT and ultimately it's a performance in the reaction of choice that we want to improve and, and measure. Um, having said that, uh, for a lot of the work we've been doing on, on the GOAs uh, with, uh, with Neil's team, uh, we, we looked at some of those variants in, in more detail uh, to, to study each of the steps of the catalysis uh, 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 um, <clears throat> better and, and to understand them more. Uh, so, so for those, uh, in those cases, we would purify the enzymes and, and, and measure the kinetics. Neil, would you like to add anything here? Just that this is something I think we want to understand better in the future too. And, you know, taking a rigorous approach to the kinetics and mechanism of a lot of these transformations is, is going to be critical. I've, I've got a, um, I've got a question and, and it's related to a question we got from Susan, um, Susan Gray. Uh, so, in terms of the electrochemistry, you, you've done quite a lot of detailed study with the oxidation and the, the mediators and that. So um, I might have not picked up on it appropriately, but in terms of the electrodes that you use for that reaction, did you look at any other electrodes like platinum, etc.? Do sorry, do other electrodes work? Was that looking at the type, the different materials for the electrode? Yeah, so they were both platinum in this case. Um, we tried a few others. These were kind of what gave us the best results at the start. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there are other opportunities there, but again, we had sort of a limited amount of time to, to look at this and uh, and uh, that, that's what we came up with. But yeah, I think this is one of the limitations for us with electrochemistry. We've gotten very good at high throughput experimentation for other reaction types. Um, being able to screen more electrodes quickly is something we really want to be able to do. And so we're working on developing scaled down devices where we can do this in a plate format, similar to the way that we screen other reaction types. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it'd be interesting to see what Bill Bowen would say about that. Yeah. <laughs> quite active in that area. Um, yep. we, haven't gotten, we haven't gotten this week. Um, there was a question from Jiao Jia Huao, I think his name is. So he's talking, I think it's related to uh, Fred's question, uh, looking at the interface of enzymatic and electrochemical process. Um, so he's curious how you separate and purify the intermediate that you hand over to the next process. 
he highlighted the situation with the um, with the uh, antiviral drug, which crashes out the solution. But in some of the other analogs, how did that work? The other intermediate sense in terms of isolation so, and purification. Sure. So, I mean, the hope is that um, that after the electrochemical step, that you would just be able to cascade this into the rest of the chemistry without removing anything. Um, you have a mediator in there, but that should be fairly inert without electric without electricity going through the system. So, yeah, we were purposely trying to design a system that wouldn't really require isolation along the way or purification. Yeah. Fred, do you have any any follow up questions? Uh, so no I had a wrap up, surely. I yeah, do I, I I was just curious, uh, Neil, and about the um. The opportunity to use pressurized reactions with gas phase oxygen. Yeah. Did you try yeah. pressure? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, we're always concerned about flammability in any kind of chemical manufacturing. Um, here we do have the benefit of, of working in water, which helps to some degree, but there are still some flammable components. Um, our safety group that did an evaluation of this were comfortable with us bubbling um, 10 percent nitrogen or 10 percent oxygen and nitrogen through the system, but not going any higher than that. Um, you're right, though, that we could pressurize it and um, and instead of bubbling, that would be a way to do it. Um, it actually requires us to go to different vessels than we would typically use. So vendors, for example, have fewer high pressure vessels than they do standard ones. And so there was a, a real advantage here to um, to just using air. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just mention, you know, an aerobic oxidation in general is a tough reaction. And, you know, we've had some conversations with Shannon Stahl about this, that he's generally, he's, he's creating this really green chemistry on one hand, but oxygen may be a green oxidant, but it's not the easiest to use. And so there are challenges associated here. Um, one thing that we considered was adding hydrogen peroxide into the system. You can imagine that would be turned over and go right into the cycle. Um, but unfortunately, because of the early problems with the low activity of catalase, we wanted to avoid that option as well. Okay, thanks. Really, really good presentation, guys. Um, I think it's been a really nice end to the series. Uh, so just wanted to thank all of our speakers um, from the last 13 weeks. Uh, I don't think we... Um, I don't think we, uh, I just realized I didn't have my camera on. I don't think we um, thought that we would end up having this many sessions. I think when we when we originally planned on setting the, uh, the webinar series up, we, we put in four sessions with four speakers and it's uh, turned into a, to a, a, a big, long 13 week uh, series, uh, including the retro teams as well, which I've not included on this slide. Uh, but yeah, we just wanted to say a massive thanks to, to all of our speakers. Um, we obviously couldn't have done it without you guys and everyone's put a huge amount of effort in so thanks to everyone um and we'd also like to, to thank um all the guys at the sci in particular jackie Shade, theo and chris uh, again we we wouldn't have been able to to, to organize all of this without you um so massive thanks to you guys for for helping out and then finally i'd just like to say that the um we are planning on continuing the series uh, later on in the year. So I think we've got some sessions booked in for uh, sort of mid-September time, but we'll announce those dates uh, later on in the year. Uh, and uh, we hope to see you guys all of those those sessions as well. Uh, and then just a, a final plug for, for membership. Um, obviously the, the events and the, the series has really been hit hard by the lockdown period. Um, so please do sign up uh, with membership because it, it really does help us organize uh, events such as this um, and uh, which is obviously really good for the, the, the chemistry community. So I think, um, yeah, finally, big thank you to all of our speakers, uh, Neil and Anya for, for presenting a really, really good end to the series today. Fantastic talk, really, really good fun, Some really cool, great chemistry in there today. And uh, thanks for you guys for, for dialing in and listening. And we look forward to seeing you later on the year uh, in September time. Thank you so much, Oliver and everyone, uh, for yeah, organizing again. and having us. Yep, that's yeah. a pleasure. I've yeah, still got about five all. questions really? to ask you, but I'll probably have to catch up with you later. <laughs> yeah, so feel free to reach out uh, to both of us uh, um, if you have any further uh, questions. We have yeah. to answer. Thanks, Anya. Yeah. That's fantastic talk, guys. Have a good day, the rest of you. Right.
Take care. See you guys Enjoy later. Yeah. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.